Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences around the world. We invite you to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Robert Jonas, best known to his friends simply as Jonas. Jonas is a psychotherapist, a spiritual guide and environmental activist, a musician, and a writer whose books I have enjoyed. He's the founder of The Empty Bell, which is a retreat center for Buddhist Christian dialogue located in Western Massachusetts. Jonas has written a new book, My Dear Far Nearness, The Holy Trinity as Spiritual Practice. That's what we're going to talk about today. Jonas, welcome to Henry Now and Now and Then. Hi, Karen. Thank you. I'm in Northampton, Massachusetts, and you're up there in Toronto, right? That's right. For today, that's where I am, and that's where you are. That's that's so cool. Now, you and your wife, Margaret Bullitt, Jonas, have been dear friends of Henry Nouwen. I'm really curious, where does the theology and spiritual vision expressed in My Dear Far Nearness, the Holy Trinity as spiritual practice, touch the theology and spirituality of Henry Nouwen? Yeah, really good question. Um... I need to say something quickly about my spiritual path, and that is that um, I grew up Lutheran in Wisconsin and went to Luther College, transferred during the Vietnam War to Dartmouth College, majored in government. Then I was a farmer. Then I went to Harvard (laughs) to get a a doctorate in psychology. Then I was a therapist. Then I started The Empty Bell, and now I'm here, and I'm married, and I've got two kids and two grandchildren. (laughs) <laughs> so and anything I say comes out of my personal history. You know, these days we all travel so many different paths. And um, a major path for me was, of course, Henry. Uh, I met Henry in 1983 in, uh, when I was a graduate student at Harvard, and Henry was teaching at Harvard Divinity School. And we, we became friends, and then uh, we visited with each other. And he really um, – I was about to leave the Roman Catholic tradition when I met him. Uh, I was taking Vipassana Buddhist meditation courses and really appreciating the quietness and the moment-to-moment awakeness of Zen, for example, um, which I also studied. And um, so I was making friends with Henry and then going to his preaching and his presentations as and sometimes in the same week I'd be going on a Zen retreat or a Vipassana Buddhist retreat. And so I was thinking all the time, what do they have to do with each other? Are they, these traditions come from different parts of the world. Henry's Dutch. I'm American. Um, is there any common ground in all these spiritual approaches? Um, so that wonderment led me to think about the Holy Trinity. Um, and it, let, let me say first that my my first um, uh, wonderment about I like that word wonderment. I don't oh, use yeah. it very much. Um, my first wonderment about East West dialogue and spirituality in uh, Buddhism and Christianity was uh, when I walked into a, a, a Taekwondo karate course at Dartmouth College when I was an undergraduate, and the teacher was, had been trained in Chan meditation. So I learned for the first time to sit down and be quiet and to listen, and to listen inwardly. For what? I wasn't sure. All I could see if, as I listened inwardly was uh, what Buddhists call monkey mind. <laughs> I'm thinking, <laughs> thinking, thinking, thinking. I'm nervous. I'm uh, uh, anxious about the future. I'm remembering and regretting the past. And it just seemed like a, a very shallow way to live. But I sat, and I... I um, uh, continued to wonder. Uh, the teacher had us walk out into Hanover snow and bare feet, and he said, warm your feet with chi. And I had grown up, as, as I mentioned, as a, as a Christian, so I wondered, did Jesus experience chi? What, what is that? Uh, uh, the spirituality of the body? I never heard of that. Um, and what is sitting on a cushion doing nothing? That's a sin, uh, in the Lutheran tradition, to do nothing is sinful. Uh, you could be out there helping people all the time. So it was a great um, challenge for me to feeling drawn to two traditions, East and West, that seem so fundamentally different. Well, then uh, at Harvard, I m- met Henry, and 
what I loved about him was that he had psychological depth and he could he could quote Maslow and Freud and 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 yet he had this incredible magnificence of presence um that um ignited my memory of Jesus when I was a kid, uh when my German Lutheran grandmother taught me Ich bin klein, mein Herz ist rein. Niemand im Wohnen aus Jesus allein. I'm small, my heart is pure. No one lives in my heart but Jesus alone. And that was an experience of the timeless Jesus that um, Henry reignited in me uh, in my 20s, uh, early 30s. And um, his message about all of us being the beloved um, was striking. Was ju- was just um, it pierced my heart. I have to use the word striking. Pierced my heart, and and so my friendship with him uh, went on for you know, about the ten years before he died. And in the last year of his uh, his life, he lived with us for three months. And he came to the Empty Bell. I had chartered uh, started a retreat center in a separate building in Watertown, Massachusetts, and he would come to our meditations and. I loved it, and he would sometimes do, do Eucharist there, and, and I felt that um, he he was all about interpersonal presence. He was all about belovedness of the I Thou dimension in the I Thou dimension, something that the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber really highlighted as an important fundamental aspect of spiritual life. I Thou, um, as when someone says to us, "I love you." Or we say to someone, I love you. That was Henry's territory, that Jesus was living in the I love you territory. And it, it, so, so I um, began to wonder if there is such a thing as a common universal spiritual life, how, how could it bridge the apparent differences between East and West? Henry was not incredibly, you know, d- comfortable with Zen meditation. When I had Zen teachers come to speak and so on, he enjoyed the conversations, but he, he was, a, he was a little nervous uh, usually. And so, um, the Holy Trinity happened to me, uh, in a new way when I read, um, Raimondo Panikkar, who was a theologian whose mother was Roman Catholic and his father was Hindu. Raimondo Panikkar thought he had actually it wasn't a thought it was an experience that the holy trinity is three dimensions of ourselves of who we are so when we read in genesis uh, that we are made in the image and likeness of god well of course who is god for christians god is a trinitarian presence god is a perichoresis a dance around of love according to the um, theologians who met at the, uh, to, to formulate the Nicene Creed, a dance round of love. Um, but if, if we're made in that image, then what, what is that? How, that's confusing. I, we're made in the image of the Trinity? That would mean, and uh, Ramanda Panikkar's idea was um, that um, each of the so-called persons of the Trinity, hypostases was the... Uh, was Greek, um, that each person of the Trinity is a dimension of our own awareness. So there's the, the fir- to understand the first person who is beyond all conceptualization, the, the creator cannot be encapsulated by any formulation of words or images. And if we are to understand the mystery of the creator, we must be in touch with the mystery of who we are. And if we are to understand the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, then we must be in that dimension of the I thou love of th- that Jesus manifested to everyone. And if we are to understand the third person of the Trinity, then we must be in touch with that. The um, well, uh, we use the word ego. Well, the third person would be like we go. <laughs> the third person of the Trinity is the communitarian our draw to communitarian, communitarian life, loving each other in community, being the beloved community, as Martin Luther King described it, the being the beloved community. So 
There's the first person is mystery. The second person is the I thou relationship dimension. And the third person is community building and the, and the joy and the awakening of being uh, in the, in a beloved community. So there you have the first, second, third persons of the Trinity. And that's what, my new book is about. I finally get to that point. <laughs> you, you've told me an awful lot. That's that's amazing. One of the things I found in the book, and it reminded me so much of Henry. You mentioned at some point in the book that your plumb line is Jesus Christ, and I've often described that of Henry because I found that with Henry, it was like you know he had a pendulum that could swing one way or the other, but it always came to back to that center line in him of a relationship yes. with Jesus. He was very clear on that. It's interesting because I can't help but ask, can a person be both a Christian and a Buddhist? I'm curious. <laughs> yes. I, I probably might have struggled a bit with that, but tell me why you think that's possible. Uh, well, first of all, I should mention um, a wonderful book that came out a few years ago by Paul Knitter, who is a theologian, and it's called Without Buddha, I Could Not Be a Christian. And um, Paul Knitter had been a Roman Catholic all his life, and he married um, a Buddhist woman. Uh, who had, I think she had been a nun. I can't remember her name, but um, so he, he, in his struggle to realize, is there a common ground between Buddhism and Christianity? He, he, he made that statement without Buddha, I could not be a Christian. And so um, here's what it is for me. Um, When you and I, Karen, are talking to each other in relationship and I say, I love you. uh, Notice what happens to awareness. Um, there's a, there's a focus to our awareness. Um, I love you. You're standing. You there's an well. We're on the telephone, so there are no eyes involved right now. We, our eyes are somewhere else. But if if two people are looking at one another eye to eye and they say um, I, I love you, one person says I love you. There's a focused awareness. Now, but then also think uh, that the other person's not physically there, and we're just in our rooms. And we're simply breathing, and we're aware of a lot of things, of uh, memories, and we see what's happening in the room. There's visual stuff. There's, there's worries and, and anxieties. And all these things are coming through this space of awareness without a focus because there's no one right there. That space without a focus and without being attached to, to anything, without being attached to memory or looking forward into the future or worry without being attached to an, any object. There's awareness itself as we're simply sitting here. Um, that awareness itself, to me, is divine awareness. Divine awareness is free of attachment to any, any self, uh, any object of awareness. And that's how I describe it in the book. And this idea is, you know, goes back to Meister Eckhart. Uh, you can find it in Aristotle, in Aquinas. Um, and many other theologians that I explore, I explored on the way to writing the book. And maybe here's a good point to mention that I, I created a new website called My Dear Far Nearness. It's um, www. My Dear Far Nearness, a dash between the far and the near, My Dear Far Nearness um, dot org. And there I I introduce 18 Christian mystics. Back to Cassian and, um, uh, well, Christian sort of Plotinus and others, um, and then forward through Meister Eckhart and St. Teresa of Avila and, and, um, and Thomas Merton and others, and Henry. And um, there on the website, you've, you'll find a, a brief description of theologians who emphasize the mystery that we are, the interpersonal belovedness that we are, and the communitarian um, uh, uh, beloved community that we are. All three, each one is a different mode of awareness. We adjust our awareness. And so the Buddhist practice helped me to be more in touch with what what I as a Christian call the the great limitless mystery of God's presence without Mm -hmm. any focus, Mm -hmm. without attachment to, Mm -hmm. to anything. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, um, folks there would use an, a name, a name for for that God that is limitless and total mystery. And we're dwelling in that presence. And that name they use is Ein Sof, E I N S O F. Um, we don't have a specific name for God who is limitless mystery. We have to say it out in a string of words. 
So uh, Henry, for me, is an exemplar of the second person of the Trinity, the the beloved I love you dimension, interpersonal love, uh, is a divine dimension of awareness, but it's different than the more kind of Buddhistic Meister Eckhart-y uh, first person of total mystery, and also different from our communitarian awareness when we're with others uh, in a uh, love community and. Uh, that's why I started the Empty Bell community, is people learning to love one another um, in the presence of God. So those are the three. It's interesting because the title, My Dear Far Nearness, honestly mm-hmm. comes, just puts question marks all over my head. It's it's nice the way you follow it up. You say the Holy Trinity as spiritual practice. Yeah. So maybe we should dip into that. How do you go into spiritual practice? You, you take time to unwrap your perspective of the Holy Trinity, the 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 Godhead three in one, you um, speak of each one, and then I think it'd be interesting for people to hear how that works itself into a spiritual practice. That, that's a good question. Um, let me first answer your first, <clears throat> what you first noticed. Um, the title? <laughs> yeah, uh, the name, My Dear Far Nearness. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I received that name from Marguerite Poirot. Um, who was uh, a, a Christian mystic uh, in and died in 1310. And uh, I love her work. It, most folks don't know that this woman inspired Meister Eckhart. Everybody knows mm-hmm. about Meister Eckhart, but yeah. Marguerite Poirette, she was incredible. And um, she named, that was her name for God, my dear far nearness, because God is both near and far. God is within us, but not entirely with the God is everywhere. Okay. Um, and I make a big point of this in the in the book that God has no location. When I when I grew up Lutheran, God was up in the sky somewhere. God uh-huh. was separate, uh-huh. and God created me as separate. But no, I follow the the uh, the inspiration of people like us, uh, Scotus Irigena, who is uh, you know a, a, a Scottish theologian, and he said we are created from within God. We aren't created separate from God. That changes everything. Wow. If we are within God, God's not somewhere else, then wow, that, that's a complete transformation of awareness. And, and so uh, I bring uh, in the, in the uh, first dimension of being awake, not doing anything, not focusing, simply being awake and alive. Um, everything that passes through monkey mind, <laughs> as Buddhists would say, Everything that's passing through is passing through in the presence of my dear far nearness. And so that's a spiritual practice. But yet, um, for example, when it, I just I just came back from the hospital with Margaret and my wife, and Margaret had her second hip replacement. <laughs> and um, we were in Boston, and so it was a spiritual practice for me for a week to be to pretty much let go of all my work and be with her. She had to, of course, let go of all her work. She's doing great climate change work. So I, um, it was a practice for me to love her in the interpersonal dimension, the I love you dimension, in so many ways, and saying that to her occasionally, I love you, um, and her saying that to me in the midst of pain and f- some fear about the surgery and all that kind of stuff. And yet there were also... S- innumerable moments where I was called to be present, simply present. Um, not a lot of I thou, I thou uh, sort of interactions or exchanges or anything, simply being awake. And one of the things I've learned to be awake to is, is, is uh, well, an, an, there's anxiety and fear, but there's also in interpersonal relationships, simply uh, irritation and annoyance. <laughs> things come up and <laughs> and that's a practice for me in the in the first dimension that I simply without being attached I watch and feel the irritation come through my body and the annoyance come through my body and let it go just let it go that is essential zen practice um and yet it's it's christian why not and i i feel that um Christ experienced real presence of mind. When he was encountered, for example, with the woman who was caught in adultery, um, he could have responded in all kinds of ways that were, you know, that he had learned in Hebrew scripture, and and he could have participated in the stoning of the woman and all. But no, what did he do? He he was silent for a moment, 
and he dropped to the ground and he he moved his finger in the dirt. I love that because he touched the earth. And that's what Buddha did when he was enlightened. He touched the earth. And then when he arose, he said, okay, which one, the one who was without sin can cast the first stone. Oh my God, that was brilliant. And where did it come from? He, it came out of nowhere, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, I might be projecting that, but that's my sense. He was so awake and alive in a dangerous moment his, his life and his ministry was at stake, and he came up with this incredible, brilliant new line. <laughs> the one without sin cast the first stone. I love that. I love it, too. That is probably one of my very favorite scenes. And as you describe it, I think he comes down to the level that she's been thrown to and meets her there is what I would envision. But I, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things that has that kind of visual drama to it. And we always say, what were you writing in the sand? And the, I, I never thought about you were just touching it. You know, we, we go back to Genesis 1, for, you know, the very beginning of creation and the sense we've been formed out of the earth, you know. It's, out of it's nothing. Out of nothing, yeah. And Karen, that, that's where it connects with uh, my understanding. of I have a, a good friend. I'm making a friend with an astronomer, and we talk about the Big Bang, and or uh, Thomas Berry called it the great flaring forth. In the moment before creation appeared, there was nothing, no space and no time. And, and I think that's really, really important that we have a, a glimpse of that in our own awareness. We can be in a place of, of nothing. I mean, this is what actually Marguerite Porette said, become nothing. What does that mean? It means like being, being a blank piece of paper where anything can show up. You, you're so open that if you know, if God appears or a person, it doesn't matter. Anything that appears, um, you're aware of it and you're open to, uh, it's limitless awareness. That's very Zen, but it also appears in so many Christian mystics throughout the ages, mm. being ready for anything, being open to everything. And out of that comes this incredible, all the incredible sayings of Jesus. So like, for example, when he knows he's going to die, he says, I'm in. He says to his friends, I'm in you and you're in me. He doesn't separate himself. Mm-hmm. This is a big teaching in Zen is not to separate ourselves from others or the world, that we are each a microcosm microcosm of the whole. And I, I love that way of living. It's a challenge. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> but, but to, be, to be no one and everyone at the same time, in a sense, is real freedom. Now, let me ask you, who did you intend this book for? Who's the audience? Let's, let's tell the people that are listening what, who this is for and, and what it offers. <laughs> Holy cow. I'm particularly into the spiritual practices of, the, of these, the three aspects of the Trinity. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm very concerned, Karen, with the fact that so many Christians, are, uh, the Christian churches are disappearing. Uh, oh, my yes. wife is an Episcopal priest, as you know, and... and um, I would say here in Western Massachusetts, it's been a pattern now for um, as far as since we've lived here, I would say the last 15 years, about one parish a year closes. And, and it's happening all over the country, not in every denomination, but in many of them. Uh, young people are not flocking to the churches anymore like they did when I was a kid. Something is happening here. And I think that the, the Christian path, it needs, need, needs a new doorway to be opened. And I think that's what this is, that God is within us. We are made in the image and likeness of, the tr- of a Trinitarian awareness, of being open, being a- available to mystery, and connecting with people one-on-one, with the, and not being ashamed of, I love you, and I, I, I'm so happy to hear that you love me, and the beloved community, what we can create together in a community of love. I think the world, I think Christians need this, a new message about God, um, and I also think that non-Christians understand this. There are resonances of this Trinitarian awareness in Buddhism, in, in the Trikaya, the, the, uh, the three teachings, and there are resonances in the, uh, oh gosh, right now I'm forgetting the name. In the Hindu tradition, there's a Trinity too. They're not exactly the same, but I think there's something universal about this approach that will deepen the life of Christians and also connect Christians with the depths of other faiths. 
it's interesting because you remind me of the number of people we call them the nuns the ones who you know check at the bottom of the page are you this are you that are you and none of the above but it's interesting yeah. because so often they'll say i'm spiritual but uh, i'm not religious and yeah. that's a big challenge right now for the church to understand what does that look like how do i because the person made in the image of god has what you're saying has this incredible reality created by God, God living in them and through them. Uh, it is actually a really profound yes. um, a concept you're sharing. Yes, but let me add this. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> I'm sure it's not, but, it, you know, in a sense, we've been given the Holy Spirit to be with us. We have this rich and deep and wonderful tradition. Tell me a little bit about the spiritual practices that you have related to in this in the book that might be really of use to others. Yeah, uh, let me first say that uh, an easy way into that is to, is if folks would go to mydearfarnearness.org. I introduce the Holy Trinity, then I have spiritual practices. Practicing the first person in solitude, practicing the second person in solitude, practicing the third person in solitude. And the next section is practicing the first person in relationships practicing the second person in relationships, practicing third person in relationships. And each practice is a little different. Yeah. Um, so it sounds complex, but once you get into it, it's just, just ourselves. It's a very natural. Um, the reason I think it's a challenge is because in the first person to realize that, we're, um, that we are mystery, um, coming from nowhere, uh, as as we're told in scripture and also by the mystics, is that uh, we, we are so attached to the world. We're so attached to things. We're, in fact, we're so attached to opinions and, and, and our own narratives about what the world is that we get attached to these things, and then we defend them. So we end up in this incredible polarization we have politically in the United States, for example. The, the people on the right and the people on the left, and the basic mindset of that in awareness is I'm right and you're wrong. I'm right and you're wrong. And that's what our eyes are looking for and our ears are listening for all the time. But that is a, that's a total um, adumbration, if you overshadowing of, of the Christ's presence. Christ's presence is to I'm in you and you're in me it, with no exceptions. And so um, th th this requires a kind of occasional I'm not saying everybody should meditate 20 minutes a day, um, but just to sit down and do nothing and be with your own mind and body and your heart uh, quietly for I try to do it 20 minutes a day. I don't say everybody has to do that, but I have three empty bell groups and each one starts with 20 minutes of silence. And this is what we're, we're trying to be in contact with that place of mystery where we don't know. You know, you know the classic, the cloud of unknowing, mm -hmm. and and also Thomas Merton's phrase that he used for that place of being nothing. He called it le point vierge, the empty place, mm -hmm. and that place is timeless. It is not connected to the linear time world, which is most of us are li living in linear time only, and that that's an overshadowing of Christ's presence, which is timeless. You mentioned meditation, but. I'm going to ask you a really basic question. Uh, what's the difference between meditation and contemplation? Yeah, oh boy, it's a big topic. But, um, you know, in the United States, uh, when I was introduced to um, meditation, that word, it was in the early 70s um, with the Trappist monks here in, in, uh, in uh, well, there, there were other paths, but the Trappist monks here uh, began to be trained in Vipassana meditation. And, and Trappists are Thomas Merton's tradition. And um, they talked about mindfulness. They began to use the, the Buddhist term mindfulness. And, you know, it's the mindfulness in meditation now has become incredibly popular in the United States. So if, if you go online and Google mindfulness meditation, you'll find hundreds of teachers. And what they're all, what they're all teaching is simply to be present. Sit down, do nothing, and be present and trust. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, um, compassion naturally arises from this practice of meditation, letting all of our attachments go, being free, inwardly free of, of attachment to our own opinions, for example, um, and, um, and 
compassion just arises. I, I've been on with the Dalai Lama on three retreats in uh, India and in Italy and Belfast, and each time he, he was with a Christian monk, uh, of, of Father Lawrence Freeman. Um, each each time they commented on how um, it difficult it is, and how it really requires an actual practice of being silent in meditation to re to see our attachments and let them go. Well, in we have Christian. It turns out we have a meditative experience that goes back to Cassian in the early centuries after Christ, and this is what the the Trappist monks started to notice. So now we have contemplative prayer. We have um, contemplation in action. Richard Rohr. We um, we had Thomas Keating's approach, uh, Father Lawrence Freeman's approach in the Catholic tradition. These all these are kinds of meditation. But they're not Buddhist. They're, you, um, they're Christian in this sense that when we sit in silence and we're not necessarily praying, uh, we're simply being aware and awake and we're trusting that God's presence is with us no matter what comes up. If a worry comes up or a regret or an anger um, or shame, all these things that can come up on a day-to-day -day basis, hour to hour, moment to moment, uh, we, we just assume God's present with us in that experience because God became human in Jesus. So God knows and God is with us. That makes contemplation for me, Christian contemplation, a little different from Buddhist meditation because in Buddhist meditation, you might say, well, there's Buddha's presence, but people generally don't talk that way. Um, it's, it's as if really no one's there. And, and there's a beauty of that, and compassion arises, but it's not the same as Christian contemplation. I, there's a lovely quote I'm just looking at right now in your book, mm. and uh, I'd love to just read it to you and then just get your additional comments. You write, I'm also reminded of Henry Nouwen's image of spiritual growth being a furnace of transformation. Huh. Yeah. Sometimes buried experiences of abuse or abandonment can arise. Yet another clue that our habits of conscious thinking aren't necessarily the whole story. We can't think our way out of suffering or think our way to God. Yeah. You wrote that, and it's interesting because I can see why you and, and Henry would be such kindred spirits. You're psychologists, but you have that center line of, of what is this furnace of transformation that God is offering? What my psychological training did for me, I was trained, by the way, at Harvard in a psychodynamic approach which originated with Freud, of course, and then there was Jung and uh, then other adaptations. But the basic idea there is that our self is formed in relationship. We need an ego. So meditation and contemplation are not meant to, to you know, uh, disappear the ego. We need an ego to survive. Um, people without an ego suffer a lot, and um, they don't have a core self. We need a core self. The way I describe it is... Um, it, to be to honor the psychological tradition that I I have so helped me um, as we practice this letting go that I'm describing in the attachment we become transparent our ego becomes transparent to the presence to God's presence because we're not holding back we're not trying to make the world into something we want it to be back to the Garden of Eden you know we I'm, I'm a, I want that apple I'm going to take it I don't need God no it's 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 being transparent means that uh, the presence in me takes over my life. And so that's the, but that requires, that leads us into the furnace transformation because that means I have to face things like, like I grew up in a, a wonderful family, but it was alcoholic. Um, my parents owned a bar from the time I was eight to when I was 18. Uh, my parents were divorced, two different dad, a daddy and a stepdaddy and my mom. And uh, But alcohol was always part of the story when very often they'd come home at 2 a.m. and drunk. And there was domestic violence, and I'd be awakened by the shouting and the hitting and the black eyes in the morning. And it was shameful. But I, you know, I succeeded in high school. I was the captain of the football team, and then I went to Dartmouth College. Oh, my God. All these incredible. How did I do it? Well, I did it because I hid my shame. I hid my shame that I my I didn't have a wow. a good family life I, like a lot of other kids. I didn't have a father. He left our family. Uh, my parents were very often alcoholic, and and I was ashamed. But I that drove me to succeed a lot. So I you know three 
three graduate degrees. <laughs> so, and I thought somehow in my conscious life, I thought I'm going to accomplish a lot. But w- underneath was this shame and guilt and, and regret and, and anger too. Um, and it was, it was the silence of meditation and, and being with some wonderful therapists who helped me see the shame and experience it. And that's like a furnace of transformation. Face the shame, face the guilt, all the things we could have done and didn't do, all the people we've hurt, that all has to be thrown into the fire if we're going to be transformed. Jonas, you always bring the good stuff. It's just (laughs) such a treat to talk with you. It really is. You're a treasure, and you've been such a treasure to the Henry Nowen Society. You and Margaret, for example, I hope you don't mind if I share. You've made this decision to include the Henry Nowen Society in your will, just as a, as a way of supporting that the ongoing voice of Henry might continue. And I, I am so grateful. We are all so grateful. That's a beautiful gift. Um, you have been so present to us in so many ways. But I go back, too, to when Henry was in pain and when you were in pain. You folks met the way friends meet. They meet over and come together and become there for each other. And I know that Henry was there for you and Margaret through one of the roughest times of your life. Yeah. But I also know that you were there for him. Absolutely, yeah. And it was a mutual discernment of who who we are and who do we want to be that Henry and I did that for each other. And that ch- that's a chapter in the book called Discernment that, as you know, that Michael Christensen and Rebecca Laird wrote. Uh, I wrote the introductory chapel about a chapter about that experience with Henry that discernment is sometimes mutual. We do it with friends. We do it with therapists, with spiritual directors. We discern together. We don't just do it by ourselves. Now, I know people are going to want to visit your website, and I'll make sure that they get links to it. And they will probably want to pick up this book, My Dear Far Nearness, The Holy Trinity as Spiritual Practice. It's rich. It's deep and thoughtful and uh, challenging. And, uh, well worth the read. I also want to mention, you've written other books, and one of my very favorites was the first that I picked up. You wrote, and this was for um, it was for the Modern Spiritual Masters series. You wrote on Henry Nowen, and it was writing selected writings yeah. with an introduction. And it was interesting because this book became a bit of a, in quotes, Bible to me at the time. I was doing the documentary oh, yeah. on Henry, and I found your life story, your your kind of putting together of Henry's story became really a, a good narrative for me, and I followed it. And then here's kind of an interesting little aspect to this book, Henry Now and uh, this Robert Jonas book. By the way, it's put out by Orbis. Let me add something there, Karen. Two things. One is I'm so grateful to you for the incredible leadership that you have brought to the Henry Now and Society because, as you know, I used to be on the board, and there were lots of times – when I was on the board, that the society wasn't, you know, hardly going anywhere. But look, the beautiful things that you've done since you've been there, and I'm just very grateful. Thank you. Oh, that's so sweet of you to say, Jonas. You're missed. We'd love you back on the board <laughs> if you want to come back. But do you know, it's so interesting. There are exciting things happening. I think one of the most exciting things is is just that we can use the podcast to to, to continue to find how. Henry is speaking today in the lives of the people that are writing and leading us spiritually today. And you're certainly somebody who brings something new to the table through this uh, very insightful book that you have written, which really captures a lifetime of study that's been going on for you. Oh, you better stop now. I'm going to start to cry. Okay, we, we can't have tears. I was just going to tell you this great story about the, the little book of selected writings. It had so impacted me that I gave it to a friend who didn't know anything about Henry now. And, and he basically, uh, he was from Holland, but he didn't know anything about him. And he said, I got a call one day. It was about six months later. He said, you know that book you gave me? It sat at the side of my bed for about three or four months. Wow. He said, and then I read it. And he said, and then I read it again, and then I read it again. (laughs) And it was really a path through Henry back to a relationship with God because he had really walked away in his, in any kind of sense of faith. But this was so, you made some very beautiful choices in here. When I was writing that book, I was living in, in, in near Cambridge, 
and I got really stuck in the writing of it because I started looking at Henry's about that time, about 30 books, and, and I just got so lost. I don't know what to do with this. I, I know so much about Henry, and I love everything he said. Well, what I did, I finally got to a place of giving up. Like, I can't do this. Orbis Books asked me to write it. Mm-hmm. And what I did is I put a, a photograph of Henry next to the computer, and I just prayed, Henry, help me decide what you wanted me to say in this book. And it really, honestly, that's, that broke the dam. Um, and then I could write it. I, uh-huh. This is not about me. It's about Henry. I need to let Henry speak yeah. through my book. Well, he does. He speaks wonderfully through that book. The, the fellow that really came back into a very powerful relationship with the Lord, he came on our board. And then the two of us decided we'd buy a box of these books. I think it must have been 24. <laughs> and we split it and we said, if this had such an impact on you, let's just send it to a whole bunch of people that don't know Henry and see what happens. <laughs> and so eventually all the books were gone. But it's been one of my favorite <laughs> That's books. a beautiful story. And, and you know, also, also that um, Shambhala books, the, um, the Buddhist publisher um, read that book. He, he asked me would I write a, a, a book about Henry for Buddhists. And that's how the essential Henry Nowen came out from uh, 10 years later from Shambhala Books. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. This is great. And I promise to our audience, there'll be links to everything that we've talked about today. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jonas, for being with us. Okay. Hey, thank you, Karen. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Oh, that was a delight to talk with Robert Jonas. You can hear the depth of friendship that he's had with Henry. And uh, I think you're going to get much out of visiting his site. And as well, I do recommend this other book. It's just called Henry Nowen, writing selected with an introduction by Robert A. Jonas. And we'll make sure there's links to everything. We're so delighted you've been with us today. I hope you've already signed up to receive our free daily meditations. They're written by Henry Nowen. If not, you can do that on our website at henrynowen.org. Remember, they're free, and they're a wonderful way to stay informed about the various things we have to offer to those who enjoy the writings and the teachings of Henry Nowen. We would also be so grateful if you'd consider donating to the Henry Nowen Society. Your resources help us share the daily meditations and these podcasts right around the world. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please take time to give us a review or a thumbs up or pass this on to your friends and family. Thanks for listening. Until next time.